start now or shall we wait for any other participants? Uh, uh, before uh, we start the, this uh, event, I think I need to make a report for our dean. Uh, mm -hmm. We have already, uh, there are two, more than 250 uh, participants registered in uh, this lecture and also uh, for Dr. Armin Kaivers. Uh, the dean, our dean is uh, initiate a new subject here. Uh, just already uh, start this semester about the regional law and comparative law. Uh, the participants of this class, uh, not only coming from our university, but from our faculty, but uh, also from all other universities all around Indonesia. And uh, one, uh, I, I think all the students from that class uh, is also joined with us uh, in this lecture. And so this is not only uh, uh, event for Faculty of Law University Indonesia, but also from all other students, uh, lectures, academia from all over Indonesia. Hopefully we can have a fruitful uh, discussion in this event. That's great, yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, it is now two, one. Uh, I think we shall start to uh, oh five p.m. two p.m. Uh, I think we need uh, for another four minutes uh, to join to wait for any other participants to join with us, uh, and hopefully it's already eighty participants with us, and uh, we will start in maybe four or three minutes. Now. Is that okay for Mr. Armin? Is that okay? <laughs> Wait for three fine. minutes. <laughs> it's perfectly fine for me. Uh, I can I can wake up a bit more, and. Uh, But it's really nice. This is uh, one of the small benefits of, uh, at least of the pandemic, that we can do more of these <laughs> yes. international sessions. Um, there are so many online events yeah. <laughs> throughout I'm, this I'm pandemic. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for all participants uh, who are already joined with us uh, for today. Uh, lecture. Uh, before we start our discussions, um, uh, I will inform to all of you that there will be a certificate for uh, every participants in this uh, lecture, and uh, one of our administrator will uh, will post uh, uh, the link for attendance list and make sure you are uh, fill that form correctly so we can easily identify you and put your name uh, right on uh, the certificate. Okay, I think it's already four minutes. Uh, shall we start, uh, Dr. Kivers and uh, uh, Mr. Dean, uh, Dr. Admin, uh, Dr. Edmond Makarim? Is that okay? Hey, 
Okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for participating with us in this lecture. Good morning in the Netherlands, <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kivers, uh, our honorable speakers. Uh, thank you very much for all of you who are, who are already joined with us. I think there are still more participants uh, will join with us uh, in this lecture. But without further ado, I think it is better for us to start immediately. And and this uh, very uh, important opportunities, uh, I would like to uh, inform to all of you that we are have our we ha we are now uh, in the event in the lecture of um, as already known by all of you uh, an online lecture, who is conducted by Joko Sutono Research Center, who is a research think tank from Okte of Law Universitas Indonesia and also European Legal Studies, a research center who is established by our Dean, Dr. Edmond Makarim, who put uh, very much concern about the development of uh, regional law. And thank you very much. Our Dean is already here with us. And without further ado, uh, uh, I already inform I, I already inform all of you uh, that uh, this lecture will also uh, broadcast live on YouTube Faculty of Law University of Indonesia. So, if uh, all of your friends, uh, any other uh, who want to uh, join with us, you can also watch this uh, lecture via YouTube Faculty Fakultas Hukum UI. And uh, I will give uh, the opportunity to uh, our honorable dean, uh, Dr. Edmond Makarim, uh, to open our lecture here today. Uh, Dr. Edmond Makarim, time is yours. Thank you very much, Ali Abdillah. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam, selamat sejahtera untuk kita semua. Shalom, Assalamualaikum. Amo budaya, salam kebajikan. Good afternoon, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Armin Kaifers. I hope I'm not have a mistake with the spelling. From Leiden Law School, distinguished colleagues, lecturers, and professors, chairman of Joko Sutano Research Centers, particularly by the European, European Regional Law Research Working Group, and all our distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. We are very honored to have this lecture with our honorable guest lecturer, Dr. Armin Kaivers, who will deliver an insightful lecture on his expertise about the introduction to European Union law between constitutional law and international law. As a scholar, I see there are plenty of lessons learned from and inspiration from other legal systems for development of our national legal systems. We can learn about the unique regional law which will have a supremacy system, such as uh, European Union. We can have some valuable lessons learned how the Netherlands accommodate this uh, position in the regional also, almost similar with Indonesia with the, uh, in the ASEAN or ASEAN regional. Moreover, in most of our research works, we often conduct comparative legal research to solve legal issues in local, national, or regional level. Because of this, there is an importance for all those students to have a better understanding on other legal system. Therefore, together with other colleagues, we are also initiated a new complementary course, which was also the open course for all of the university regarding regional law and comparative law. The EU law is one of the topics in this subject. We are also encourage lecturers from Faculty of Law, Universitas Indonesia to develop research on uh, comparative. For example, the European Legal Studies is uh, one of the working research group in the Joko Stone Research Center, which, is, uh, which was shared by Mr. Ali Abdillah, our moderator for this lecture now. We also have a center for other foreign legal system 
such as Ozenian countries, United States of America, China, and other ASEAN countries and many more. I thank to Joko Stono Research, Research Center and the Eurolex for conducting these fruitful lectures, which is in line with our master plan in Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia. We would like to widening and enriching our horizon of law. And we have uh, we would like to have a significant role to make an influence, influence to the regional. After this lecture, I hope there will be further collaboration with Leiden Law, Leiden Law School, especially Dr. Anmin Kaivers and his other colleague for the development of research and regional law, especially with the Euro law, Eurolex. I thank you all the participants for being here. I thank all those who have collaborated so that this lecture can help. I have a big hope that participants would have pleasant and fruitful discussion with Dr. Ali. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Best regard. Thank you warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for our honorable dean, Dr. Edmond Makarim, who already delivered a warm full opening speech for us. Uh, I urge to all participants, please, uh, hopefully you can mute first your audio. Uh, uh, we will uh, ask you to uh, turn on your audio when uh, you need to, but I think for the, uh, for, for the seminars for the, to make this seminar more conducive, I think it is better for us to mute first and uh, what, uh, when the speakers uh, deliver uh, the speech. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dean Dr. Eman Makarim, for a wonderful opening speech, which bring us to the importance of this lecture. As I already uh, told in the beginning, uh, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, EU law sometimes seen as another subject of international law for people uh, who, who are not really familiar with EU law, of course. And if we see, uh, but if we see when we look at the institutions, we look at how the system works, it resembles a country. It has a uh, court, it has parliament, and as already stated by the dean, uh, the EU law already has a supremacy doctrine and so on and so forth. And therefore, uh, for for this uh, opportunity, it is very honorable for us, honorable moment for us to have Dr. Amin Kari first to be willing to give a lecture at our faculty about a relatively a new knowledge for Indonesians, of course. Before we uh, ask Dr. Kaivers to start the lecture, I will introduce you. Dr. Amin Kaivers is Associate Professor of EU Law from Leiden Law School. His expertise in EU law, EU constitutional law, uh, and many other topics. He also director of master program of Europa Institute, if I'm not mistaken. And also he is also the director of the Compare a Research Center, who are, is focusing on comparative uh, regional law research. Uh, without further ado, um, Dr. Kyver, Dr. Kyvers, uh, time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also for your kind words, Dean. And indeed, I hope that this can be the beginning of further collaboration. Let me congratulate you on, on um, opening the, the different centers on comparative law, which I think is um, a very wise move in this time of increasing internationalization and globalization, and where global relations are shifting and changing with the US taking a very different approach meaning that there is an increased spotlight on how to collaborate in a, in a new international framework. And regional integration is one of those um, tools that can actually assist in how to do that. So I, I look forward to sharing expertise, but let me also stress very strongly that uh, in my mind, that should be a two-way bridge to the extent that I very much believe that the EU should also learn from the rest of the world. Um, you may be very aware that the EU has always had challenges of its own, but currently has a couple of spectacular ones. 
you may have heard about Brexit by now. It, in the EU, it's hard to avoid. Um, but I think that the EU can also learn from the rest of the world um, how to maybe take alternative routes to integration or how to tweak existing forms of integration, because it's a joint challenge to see how countries can collaborate while at the same time respecting national identity and national sovereignty and national democracy. So uh, for me, this is really what regional integration is about, trying to create a new system of governance that collaborates with the states, that is effective enough to make things happen for the people who should be served, but at the same time fits within national constitutional arrangements. And um, one of the reasons why we started Compare here in Leiden is actually to share experiences um, both ways, not just explaining the EU experiences, what went well, what went wrong, but also to learn from the experiences in the rest of the world. So in that extent, I'm especially grateful to be giving this, this um, first lecture for the, uh, the Center on, of European Integration, but also for the ASEAN Comparative Research Program. And I very much look forward to your questions. So um, in discussions with, with Ali, who I thank for organizing this um, and uh, who uh, I was grateful to have in Leiden as one of my students and now as one of my PhDs. Um, I, um, we discussed that I would give a short lecture, approximately 30 minutes, about the nature of, of EU law and how, to, uh, how you can understand it and place it in the context of international law. But we wanna reserve a lot of time for discussion. So it's really an open invitation for you to ask your questions so that I can spend most of my time in, in dialogue with you discussing the issues that you would prefer to discuss. Because of course I can talk on for hours and hours and hours about the EU um, in any particular subtopic, but I really want to focus on those things that are most relevant for you. Um, so let me uh, move to my presentation, which is always the more, most exciting moment for a lecturer to see if the technology works. Yes, it works. <laughs> so at least that moment went, went okay. uh, fine. Um, so indeed, the, the topic of the lecture is the, the EU between constitutional and international law. Um, so it, the main focus is to explore the nature of the European Union as such. Um, now, what will I be talking about? Um, first, very briefly, where did the EU come from? Some drivers of integration and major milestones. Um, and that is to also explain why the EU is between international law and constitutional law, but increasingly close to constitutional law, to give away my uh, conclusion at the end already. Um, because for a long time, the EU has been trying specifically to be something different than international law. So we need to understand the background of European integration, um, both to understand what the EU is, and also why the EU is facing some difficulties now. We'll get to that later. Now, then I want to focus on what makes the EU unique, as the EU itself always claims. Um, of course, nothing is really unique. We'll discuss that as well. But there's a couple of legal innovations that are particularly relevant. And I will focus on the differences with normal international law and the constitutional turn in EU law itself which means that I will be focusing on the effect of EU law. Of course, there's many other dimensions, such as the institutions, uh, the way that the EU functions politically, but I will focus primarily on these constitutional legal elements also um, because this was requested and I think it may be most relevant for the audience today um, uh, being also lawyers. And then um, where's the EU going? Because we have created this international constitutional system, this hybrid, but we are also running into difficulties, which is, I think, to be expected because it's the, just a major experiment, basically. Um, and I would like to discuss with you, using Brexit as a perspective, what is going on, where the problems are coming from, and what does this mean for the EU, and what lessons can we learn for other regional um, systems. So that's basically the, the route map for today that I would like to discuss. I will go quite quickly on some points, um, but of course, we have time for discussion. So please, if something's not clear, just um, ask me to clarify or to spend more time on it. And then I can would be more than happy to do so. Okay. Um, maybe you're ready to uh, take a little uh, advance. So possible uh, questions for discussion that I would at least be happy to discuss is um, actually a fundamental question. What is the EU? Because believe it or not, after more than 60 years, we still don't agree on what the EU actually is. We've been living in it for quite a while and we don't know. 
Now, maybe that's true for most relationships, but um, it's an interesting one for the EU. Um, is it a model for other regions? Should you try to copy elements or learn or not? Is it an anti-model? Should you try to avoid it? Um, is Brexit a unique UK problem? Is it just because the British are slightly odd or are still suffering from a colonial grandeur of fantasy? Or is it exposing a structural problem for the EU? And of course, as I said, any other point that would be interesting for you. I'm really open for any uh, perspective and any view uh, to discuss. So, genesis of EU integration. I have learned from being online a lot that baby pictures are, are used, as well as cat pictures, so I'm trying to adapt to the online reality. Um, where did the EU come from? Well, the first driver was basically the fact that Europe had been fighting internally for a long time. So there have been many continent wrecking wars. Uh, we've had centuries of warfare, often where Germany and France were involved, but also with the British in Spain and Italy. Um, and especially in the centuries preceding European integration, we'd seen a lot of fighting between Germany and France. Germany had become a, a central country. For a long time, Germany existed of small provinces and kingdoms and different uh, organizational units. When Germany united, we got a country that was clearly the most powerful in Europe. And that created um, tension, especially with France. So for more than a century, we've had France and Germany fighting with each other. Um, the 1817 Franco war was a very important one. This here you see uh, German soldiers happily marching to the front. Um, they would meet a nasty end. Um, so we had an ongoing fight also over specific regions. So there's one region between France and Germany, Elsa's Lothringen, which is very rich in coal and steel. And Germany and France had been fighting over this for a while. So Europe was very unstable. And that, of course, culminated in two world wars, which were just devastating um, in Europe, but of course also across the globe, because Europe managed to drag the rest of the world into um, this war as well. Now, what you see here are pictures of Berlin after the Second World War. So Germany after World War II was basically flat. Um, very little was left standing of the country. Now, that meant that we needed to find a way to rebuild Europe, but also stop the infighting. And surprisingly enough, one of the spurs to help Europe integrate was Russia. Because after World War II, Stalin was in power and we had a massively powerful Russia with a Red Army that was at full combat strength. Um, deployed and occupying a large part of Europe. Now, Europe therefore needed to find a way to deal with the Russian threat. And they knew that no country individually could deal with Russia, so you needed to work together. That also links to a further driver, namely US pressure. The US also needed a strong bulwark against Russia in the EU, in Europe. And therefore, the US was very interested in ensuring European collaboration. In fact, a relatively unknown fact is that European integration was a precondition for martial aid. If countries wanted to receive American aid to rebuild their countries, they needed to work together. So the US was actually pushing for European countries to work together, and they were also pushing to include Germany, because they knew that from a military point of view, no European collaboration would be strong enough if Germany was not part of it. So they needed Germany in there. Now, a fourth and important driver, and this is the theme that we will be expanding on, is the failure of international law and the failure of the League of Nations. After World War I, the international community created the League of Nations with the specific aim to avoid future wars. And the League of Nations simply failed. It was not powerful enough, not strong enough to actually prevent war. And many of the people who were involved in European integration in the beginning, many of the leading minds had worked with the League or even for the League and were strongly disappointed about international law, which meant that they needed something more than international law, because apparently international law was not strong enough, right? So one of the fears that is almost ingrained in the DNA of EU law 
is that it should never become as weak or as relatively ineffectual as international law. Now, don't get me wrong, international law is a crucial doctrine, has become more powerful over time and is a, a major force in international relations. So I'm not saying international law doesn't have effect or is not relevant. I'm just saying that the founders of the EU were afraid that it was not enough, not enough to keep Europe from fighting between its, their own countries and not enough to prevent other conflicts. So they wanted something more. Now, that then leads to a question. If you have a European continent that is in ruins, and if you do not trust public international law enough to constrain your countries, then what should you do? How do you unite and rebuild a continent that has been fighting for more than a century and has dragged the world into a complete um, global war? Now, um, this is where some of the core ideas behind the EU come from. You see here Jean Monnet, who is the only European honorary citizen so far. No one else has ever been uh, named a honorary citizen. And he is considered to be one of the founding fathers of Europe. He was a civil servant in France who had worked in the US and the UK at a huge international network going up to the leaders of different countries. And he was the drafter of the initial European integration documents, the Schuman Declaration. And there were a couple of guiding principles. And these are the principles I think that may also be interesting to discuss. Are these principles applicable to other regions? Are they unique to the EU? Are they feasible in today's world? Can you tweak them? Do you need all of them? So there's many questions we can ask about these principles. But here were a couple of his thoughts. First of all, um, you need a rule-based system. Don't tell Donald Trump. Uh, but you need a rule-based system that actually actively governs. Sorry, I, I, I'm still dealing with the entire Trump effect. But I'll, I'll try not to talk about him too much. So the law must effectively govern the action of member states i.e. rules must really guide what states do, not just what they promise, not just what they say, but how they actually act. That means that the law should be stronger than the league and international law. And it also means that individual states should not be able to stop or control or block the collaboration. Now, another theme, and this is a theme that the EU is now running into because it has an anti-democratic streak, is that after World War II, faith in politicians had been lost, uh, or in politics. And there was especially a distrust of nationalism and nationalist politics that had led to so much conflict. So there was a yearning for rational decision-making based on expertise and facts, and not on nationalistic feelings. And that also meant that they wanted to focus on those areas where you do not have high politics, not like foreign policy or sovereignty-intensive issues, but you want to focus on those areas where um, actually technocrats and people with technical expertise can make decisions, right? What are the proper characteristics of cheese and milk, uh, for example? Now, um, you need to start small and technical, but at the same time, you should deal with the key issue. And the key issue at that time, you have to imagine, was the Germo-French relationship. How do Germany and France relate? And this was forefront in the minds of all the founding fathers. How do we prevent Germany and France from fighting in a system that is based on rules and rational decision-making and not political um, nationalism? Now, if you think ahead to where the EU is now, you can already see a couple of trends. So indeed the EU has managed to become a very rational rule-based system, but you also see that the EU is abrasive, sometimes um, insults some people's feeling of sovereignty and nationality. So I would say that the seeds of Brexit were already sown here. And the EU is trying to come to terms with concepts such as sovereignty and identity um, and to give them a positive place as well, instead of just seeing them as a threat. But that's a theme we'll come back to later. Um, but the EU system indeed became the most effective international system in place. So let's have a look um, at how they did that. And the starting point was indeed small and technical. They started with just coal and steel. The idea was if we create a supranational body to control coal and steel, then we can leave all the other areas to the member states, but we can have a supranational commission that can bind the member states on issues of coal and steel. Now, that was, of course, at the same time a smart move because A, 
coal and steel were what you needed at the time to conduct war, and B, coal and steel were precisely what Germany and France had been fighting about in Elsa's Lothringen. So they took away the strongest conflict point between France and Germany, created a technical institution on this area, and then started to develop. Because the story of the EU is one of gradual development. But just to get the emotional image, this is one of my, my personal favorite pictures about European integration. You see here the leaders of the coal and steel community, including Jean Monnet, holding the first piece of steel ever created in Europe. Um, this was the first piece of coal, steel created under the coal and steel community. And some of these people had been fighting each other on the battlefield. So for them, this was a very personal, intense moment because they were now collaborating instead of fighting. At the same time, this emotion of having overcome war is an emotion that is now less active in Europe. Younger generations today no longer fear any type of European war. In that sense, the EU has worked so good that people think it's just unimaginable that we would ever enter into a conflict again, um, except in soccer matches. Um, so this driver of fearing each other is actually becoming weaker because of the success of the EU, which is another theme we might come back to. Now, also, um, and this is just to make the point that European integration is not a given. So some people assume that the way the EU is today is logical and it could not have gone any other way, right? That there is this logical inherent trend and that if you start regional integration, you have to take certain steps. That's simply not true. European integration has also been intensely political. And there have been many political fights and therefore close calls about which direction the EU would take. For example, the EU was one vote short of creating European army. The French parliament blocked it at the last moment. Um, but another example is this, um, how many members does the EU have? Actually, um, this is Jean Monnet writing in his own memoirs. He thought that the first step towards European Federation, notice that he assumed a European Federation, would, the union of, would be the union of Germany and France. So that the coal and steel community would just be Germany and France. It's only the evening before by hand that he added, ooh, other countries can join, right? So the entire development of the EU now having 27 member states partially depended on this one change of mind of one person the evening before they launched the plan. So just know that integration is not a trail wreck uh, that, that, that leads to a specific end. It is very much a political reality as well. Yeah? So in the end, we ended up with six countries starting the EU, namely France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, Luxembourg. And uh, so those are the six original founders. Now, after that, the EU kept widening and deepening. Um, so what we basically see is that the coal and steel community expands to include basically other areas. So they create in 57, the European Economic Community, the Treaty of Rome, which is still the founding treaty also of the current treaties, which means that the EU now covers the entire economy. It's not just coal and steel, it's all economy. Now, in 1992, I'm taking some leaps here. You have the Treaty of Maastricht. And this is a crucial point because the EU goes into high politics. Notice, this is after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the EU now has to deal with geopolitics anew, how to deal with the former Soviet Union. And the EU becomes much more political. And actually, many of the key Brexiteers, the people who led the Brexit revolt, became anti-EU with Maastricht. So they have, they have been fighting against the EU since 1992. This is also the introduction of the Euro, right? The Euro was not created, that took a time, but this was where they decided to create the Euro and to uh, go into more political areas. In 2009, the Lisbon Treaty was signed. That's the current legal framework. So if we talk about EU law now, the treaties that underlie the EU are the Treaty on European Union, the, the EU, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the TFEU and the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, and with Lisbon, there was further collaboration in sensitive fields. So increased collaboration in foreign relations, in justice, in criminal law. Um, so many areas that really affect national sovereignty, including deeper collaboration also on fiscal collaboration. Okay, 
Now, at the same time that the EU was becoming deeper, talking about more issues and more sensitive issues, it also became bigger. Now, there's a small video here if you want to look back later, if you're more graphically inclined. But to summarize, we started with the six in 1951. Then in 1973, there were nine, including the UK, who joined in 1973, um, and actually afterwards held a referendum where the UK people voted in favor of EU membership. Then in 1981, we had 10, Greece joined. Um, in 1986, Spain and Portugal joined, who had actually been military dictatorships until that time. Um, and they, when they democratized, could become a member. In 1995, Austria, Finland, and Sweden joined. So actually, Austria had only been a member since 1995, right? And then in uh, 2004, we had what we call the Big Bang. As I mentioned, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and 10 Eastern and Middle European countries joined the EU um, at one time. Now, this was very much a political choice. These countries were often economically very weak, but they needed um, to be stabilized. And we wanted to prevent conflict in the region after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it was very much a political choice led by Germany to let them in. In 2007, Bulgaria and Romania joined. And then in 2013, we had the last accession with Croatia. Um, and then of course, we had the first exit with the UK ever in European integration. Now, um, this just as a bit of background. So how did the EU develop? But now the question of what makes the EU unique or different or constitutional? Where I think this is always a nice summary about claims that you are unique. As an academic, I'm a bit skeptical about claims that the EU is unique. The EU is another way of humans to try to collaborate, right? We've been trying to collaborate for millennia. We've come up with different mechanisms and different systems, and the EU is one of those systems. So I don't think we learn a lot by saying that the EU is completely unique. Now, um, at the same time, when we talk about the specialness of the EU, what does the EU do different than normal international law? There's a couple of key elements that I want to focus on. Um, first of all, it's supranationalism. Now, and this is a key term because it means that instead of being intergovernmental, i.e. an agreement between governments, the EU claims to be supra, above nationals, above governments. So when the EU acts, it is actually with an authority that is higher than the states themselves. Now, normally the foundational principle of international law is sovereignty. Member states, states retain ultimate sovereignty and can only be bound by their will. In a supranational body, states can be bound against their will on some issues. So they pool, so to say, some sovereignty and they allow the institution to bind them which is crucial for effective integration because you can make decisions more easily, you can have a more effective internal market, etc. But of course, it comes at a price. Now, um, when you have a supranational body, um, it has effects for your laws. And actually, the supranational nature of the EU is captured, reflected in two key elements. Um, the EU um, institutional framework, you need different kinds of institutions, and the nature of EU law and the EU legal order. Now, I'll go briefly into the institutional framework and focus a bit longer on the um, nature of EU law. So this is the institutional system, and indeed, as Aliel already referenced at the beginning of the lecture, this looks rather national, right? You have a parliament. Then you have a council of ministers, where the ministers of the different countries meet. Um, you have a European Commission, which is the EU administration. And then you have an independent court of justice, a central bank that does the monetary policy, and a court of auditors that checks the books. Now, the European Parliament therefore creates a kind of European democratic system. It is directly elected um, and has legislative powers. You may have heard that the European Parliament is a Mickey Mouse Parliament, that it's not really powerful. These are the old stories. This was pre-Maastricht. The current European Parliament actually has more powers than many national parliaments. It is a full co-legislator and it also controls the budget. So it is a serious political powerhouse. Now, Another small thing I want to point out is that the EU now has a European Council. 
The European Council is a meeting of the heads of state. So it's the most powerful politicians, the head, the president or prime minister of every state coming to Brussels and meeting together. And of course, if you have 27 heads of state, you have tremendous political power in the room. Now notice that this only became a um, official institution with Lisbon. And it tells you something that the EU is by now so powerful that it is slowly incorporating the heads of state. The heads of state have become an EU institution, um, which shows you how important the EU has become. It is now chefsach. It is something for the highest political powers. And especially during major crises, like the financial crisis or COVID now, you see that these leaders play an important role. Now, the overarching... Um, Sorry, these are the, the three new uh, institutions compared to the original setup. Now, um, the overarching constitutional system works as such. And the idea is that the European Parliament represents the union citizens. So it is directly elected by people in every member state, although you can only vote for uh, members of parliament on your national list. The Council and the European Council represent the member states, the ministers and the heads of state. And the Commission represents the EU interest. So this is a kind of triangle. You have the EU interest as a whole, the people and the states represented. And then the Court of Justice and the Central Bank are expert bodies, and they safeguard the law and EU monetary policy. So that's the institutional system. And it already shows you that the EU is um, different from international organizations and much more far reaching. And now I wanna go into the um, nature of EU law um, and I'll go a bit quickly to make sure that I don't go over time too much. Um, and this is basically, I think the summary. Now I'm not implying that the EU is like the mob, but I thought it was a nice summary of, of what EU law says. Um, now, again, the background is public international law. If you compare it, for example, to the Paris Agreement, then it's based on the will of sovereign states. Um, the subjects are states and not individuals. And national constitutional law determines the status and effect within states. So Indonesian constitutional law determines the status of public international law in front of national courts and national law. Um, in most countries, that means that you have a dualist system. International law only enters the legal sphere if you um, allow it. And you have, of course, limited review and limited enforcement. Treaties are hard to enforce, which means that treaties tend to have a limited impact on the life of individuals and companies, right? And the EU wants to be more. So how do you do it? Well, there is three key constructs that the EU uses. Autonomy, direct effect, and supremacy, which is basically the means of the EU to make it more powerful. So what does autonomy mean? Um, this is the underlying foundation of EU law. This is why EU law can do what it does. Basically, the EU says we make our own law. What EU law is, is what EU law says, right? So the EU is the most fundamental norm. The EU is the Grund norm. It's the basis for everything. Um, so the, what EU law is, or the status of EU law, does not depend on national or other law, only on itself, which is captured by this Escher drawing. Right? So it doesn't matter what national law says about the EU. The status is dependent by itself. So what does it mean? First of all, EU law says when it applies, how it applies and what effect it has. So if you wanna know if EU law is applicable, ask EU law. That also means if you think ahead, national law cannot limit EU law. Um, all EU law concepts have autonomous meaning. You cannot use national law to interpret EU law. And national law cannot affect or define EU law. You cannot use national, national law to change or alter or impact EU law. Um, it also means that the court of justice has the final say. So national courts can apply EU law, but only the court of justice in Luxembourg has the final say. So the highest judicial institution in the EU is an EU body that binds all courts, including constitutional courts. Um, and autonomy is also the basis for the other two legal inventions, direct effect and supremacy. So let's have a look at those, right? Because it ultimately means, I don't know if you know this picture, the Baron von Munchausen, who got stuck in the mud with his horse, and then he lifted himself up by pulling on his own tail. He had long hair or bootstraps in another version. 
Now, this is basically what the EU has done. The EU was created by the member states, and then it told the member states, by the way, we are autonomous. You created us, but we're now an autonomous legal order, and we can do what we want. Now, one of the things that the EU does differently than public international law is direct effect. What does direct effect mean? It's very basic. You can rely on EU law in front of national courts. So you can walk into a Dutch court, a French court, a Greek court, and you can pull out the treaty or you can pull out EU legislation and say, I have a right under EU law. You need to grant me that right. Right? Now, there's a couple of technical conditions. I won't go into those because that's an entire four-hour lecture in itself. But national courts and national authorities have to apply EU law. Now, that's very different from public international law. In most countries, you cannot walk into a court and say, listen, there's this really nice treaty between Indonesia and Japan, and I want to rely on it. That's just not how it works. So this is very different from public international law. Also note, it depends on EU law. So national law cannot limit the direct effect. You cannot adopt a national law saying you are not allowed to, follow, to apply EU law. And then if EU law applies, it applies with supremacy. And I think this is the most, uh, the Dean also referenced it, this is the most foundational claim. The EU is higher and therefore EU law always wins. So if there's a conflict between national law and EU law, then EU law prevails, always. The doctrine of EU law is very simple. Any norm of EU law, even a decision from the commission, any law of EU law trumps national law, even national constitutions. Now notice, we'll get to that later on, most national constitutional courts disagree. So if we talk about EU law at a higher level, we can talk about how indeed, as the Dean also mentioned, national systems dealt with it. How do national systems deal with a claim of supremacy? Uh, but first we have to look at the EU claim. Um, because really constitutions, member states created a organization and then that organization said, we are now more important than your constitutions. Does the court mean that? Yes. Um, originally the court made this very explicit in Internationale Handelsgesellschaft, where they said that Supremacy is the legal basis of the community itself, which means that you cannot challenge EU law without, even based on fundamental rights, without undermining the constitutional structure of the EU as such. And um, they, they confirmed this later by saying, listen, any law, even later law, even national constitutional law should be set aside. And by the way, even lower courts can do this. So even a court of first instance can set aside the national constitution based on EU law. As they said in Maloney, it settled case law that by virtue of the principle of primacy, which is an essential feature of the EU legal order, rules of national law, even of a constitutional order, cannot be allowed to undermine the effectiveness of EU law. Now, just to let that sink in for a moment. And so this is the, the, the extent of supremacy and the uniqueness of the EU legal order, right? Um, so the EU has a very clear claim. You have primary EU law, secondary EU law, and then you have national law. I know I'm not working for Pixar, but still some graphics in there. Uh, all national and even constitutional law is lower than the EU law. Okay, um, so why is the EU then unique legally? Because if you combine this, if you combine autonomy, direct effect, and supremacy, you basically get a legal trinity that makes sure that EU law is effective, that it really affects the rights of individuals because 500 million people can go to court and enforce their EU rights and trust me, they do. So EU law is enforced not just by the commission, it is primarily enforced by individuals fighting for their own rights. And that is the strongest incentive you can have to make EU law effective. And EU law is applied by national courts who can overturn any national law that violates EU law. Now, by then, you have what I would say, basically say it's a federal legal structure. This comes close to what the US has in terms of federal doctrines, which also means that you have a constitutional legal order. In terms of the legal system, the EU is already constitutional. The interesting thing, of course, is that the EU is not a federation. It is not a state. So you have a state legal system 
in an international context. And that relates and that creates difficulties. So as I said, most national constitutional courts do not agree that EU law is supreme because EU law says so. Most national courts agree that EU law has supremacy because their constitution says so. Now, again, this would be multiple for our lectures to go through the German case law because they tend to write judgments of 150 pages. But uh, understand that the, the most common national approach is to say we support European integration, we accept it, but we cannot give up the ultimate mastery because the states remain the masters of the treaty. Um, and therefore we accept integration, we respect integration, but we retain ultimate control. Now, in most cases, these courts will just apply supremacy. So the interesting thing is that there is a difference between national courts and the EU Court of Justice, but the system works. And again, at a higher level, this is part of the secret of the EU. So to just summarize the EU as being supremacy is too direct, is also, as the Dean rightly pointed out, the national response to supremacy and the way that the national legal systems can incorporate it. So when you design your regional law, you need to take into account the capacity of national systems to incorporate this law, right? Um, so is the EU international or constitutional? Well, this is a bit the Schrodinger cat dilemma. You may know the problem from physics, um, you don't know if the cat is alive or dead. Um, and the EU is both at the same time, not dead and alive, uh, but constitutional and international. And more than 60 years after its creation, we're still discussing what it is. But the legal system is clearly more constitutional. And that's also one of the reasons behind Brexit. We see here Mr. Johnson contemplating the nature of the EU or something else, um, because I don't think he ever thought really hard about what the EU really is. Um, but of course, we now have Brexit. Um, actually, we only have two months left to conclude the final treaty between the EU and the UK um, after three years of high drama. Um, and I just want to take this as an example, because the key claim, the key slogan for Brexit was let's take back control. And in fact, Sovereignty played a key role here. And it's easy to make fun of the Brexiteers because they said a lot of things that were just wrong. But I think the slogan is very correct and points to an early problem in EU integration. How, do, how does European integration and sovereignty relate? And you need to have a convincing answer. Now, I think there are convincing answers. I think a modern theory of sovereignty is perfectly compatible with integration. But if you take a traditional Westphalian statist concept of sovereignty, you get to the position of Mr. Johnson, let's fight for our own sovereignty. Of course, it's a hollow victory. His country will be left much poorer and weaker with less power, but they will be formally sovereign to take their own uh, decisions and make their own laws, which is of course a weird choice. Is it, is it correct that you have a choice of either joining the EU or going bankrupt? If that's the case, then it's not really a, a system based on free choice or sovereignty either. So I think Brexit offers a challenge to the EU to think about a better narrative, a better construct of national sovereignty in a regional and global reality so that we have a better answer to citizens who are afraid that they lo are losing national sovereignty and democracy. Um, now, one thing to realize here is who voted for Brexit. This is the age differential. Now, you see that the older you get, the more anti-EU you get, apparently. So if I give this lecture again in 20 years' time, I may actually be pleading in favor of Brexit. We can do that as an experiment. Um, at the same time, political scientists say that um, the young people of today will not become as anti-EU as they get older. Apparently, they can calculate this. Um, another problem, you see here that um, the higher educated you are, the more pro-integration you are. So integration is primarily opposed by people with lower education, which is also logical because they suffer more. These, these are the people that risk losing their jobs. People with higher education like me, we just enjoy the benefits of integration. Um, now, 
where are we now? Uh, just if you want to have a look, these are the current agreements being uh, having that have been concluded. Of course, now we're negotiating about the future treaty. But the important thing is that um, we still haven't found a solution to the Brexit trilemma, which is basically this. The UK can only have two of the following three things. They can either have sovereignty over all laws. Now, if they want full sovereignty, they have to leave the internal market, the customs union, and they can conclude their own trade agreements. They don't want a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. And they want to maintain a full union with Northern Ireland. Now, and they can either have full sovereignty um, and no hard border, but then they cannot maintain a full union because Northern Ireland becomes part of the EU. They can have no hard border and maintain a full union, but then the entire UK needs to follow EU rules. Um, right, so they can have two of these threes. And the reason why we don't yet have a deal is because the UK cannot choose between these three uh, options. The UK wants all three. Sovereignty, no hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and full union with Northern Ireland, and it can't have all three at the same time. So if we have a deal in the coming two weeks, it is because the UK will sacrifice one of these, and my guess is that they will sacrifice full union with Northern Ireland. So they will create a separate legal regime in Northern Ireland that effectively makes Northern Ireland part of the EU, and then they have no hard border and sovereignty, but at a very high price. Right. Um, as I said, this will hurt economically. This is the calculation, by the way, by the British Central Bank about the effects of, the, um, of a no deal. Notice that if they do not have a trade agreement with the EU, it will cost them effectively 15% of GDP growth by 2024, which is a massive, um, massive impact. So, and with COVID, these predictions have only become even worse. So, um, just to summarize on a, on a light note, this is how someone summarized the choices for Brexit um, and the options that they had, um, basically concluding that it may not be a very good solution with which they've chosen. Um, but the main point I wanna make is what does this mean for the EU and what does this mean for other regions, right? We now know what the EU is, we know the impact is it has had on sovereignty and some of the pushback it has received. We also understand why the EU needs to be autonomous, supreme and directly effective. Otherwise the system doesn't work, but you pay a price in terms of sovereignty and political pushback. So that's the background that I would like to sketch on why the EU is constitutionally, legally, unidentified politically, and also uh, now in an uncertain path to the future. So let me leave it at that and uh, open the floor for um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaivers, for your very fruitful, concise, uh, and uh, insightful uh, lecture to us. I would like to uh, open the Q&A sessions. If any of you want to address questions to Dr. Kaivers, please don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand uh, using the facilities from Zoom, of course. And uh, if any of you are not really sure about uh, the language, you can ask uh, with Bahasa Indonesia and I will help you to translate the uh, questions and also the answer, of course. Is there any question? Um, I think Abirafa, Abirafa. Uh, okay, uh, there's a question from Abirafa. Uh, he is in, in the chat room and I will translate it to Dr. Kyvers. According to uh, explanations from Dr. Kyvers, it can be concluded that the EU has legal personality as an international entity. Therefore, it may, uh, it may act uh, without uh, without uh, permissions from the member state. Is that true, Dr. Kyvers? Uh, thank you for that question. Indeed, um, the EU has legal personality, so the EU can conclude international agreements by itself. Um, now, the EU can act without consent from the member states, um, and there we have to make a distinction. There's a couple of areas 
where the EU has exclusive competences and where the Commission can act. Um, so there's a couple of areas like uh, international trade agreements where the Commission can negotiate trade agreements on behalf of the EU. But at the same time, when the EU acts, often it acts through legislation. So it has to adopt a regulation or a directive. And a piece of legislation is adopted by the institutions. So if you want to adopt a directive, for example, or if you want to sign, uh, ratify a trade agreement, you need the support from the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. Now, the Council of Ministers are the member states. So the EU acts by a decision from the Council, but the Council are the member states. And the member states usually have to vote by qualified majority, which basically means that you need 55% um, of the member states representing 65% of the people to vote in favor. So a member state doesn't have a veto, but there is a vote by the member states. So the EU acts, but the EU acts because the member states in the council agreed to what the EU should do. Now, in some areas, the Council of Ministers requires unanimity. For example, if you talk about imposing sanctions, you may have heard about the EU wanting to impose more sanctions on Turkey or on Russia. If the EU wants to impose economic sanctions, they need unanimity in the council, and then every member state has a veto. And immediately you see that it becomes much more difficult because, for example, the uh, sanctions on Russia were vetoed by Cyprus, not the most powerful EU member state, because it also wanted sanctions on Turkey because it has a conflict with Turkey. So can the EU act without the member states? In some areas, yes, the EU can act without the member states. In most areas, the EU is the member state, so it acts because most member states agree. In other areas, uh, a small number of areas, each member state still has a veto, so they can only act after every member state has agreed. I hope that answers the, the question. Uh, Abir, are you with us? Yes, am I audible? Abir, hello. Okay, uh, I think it's already clear uh, explanation from Dr. Kaivers. And uh, I think we have uh, 30 minutes for discussion session. Is that okay, Dr. Kaivers? Yeah, I, have, uh, I even have the entire next hour uh, blanked. So if people want to uh, keep asking questions, that's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. If, if we run out of questions, that's also understandable, but um, I'm at your disposal. Okay. We have two uh, participants who already raised raise their hands. We have Anga Priyancha and also uh, Abdurrahman Al-Fatih, if that. Uh, Anga, you cannot, uh, could you, do you want to deliver your questions by yourself? Yes, can I? May okay. I? Yeah, yes. Yes, please. Uh, um, so I want to ask a bit uh, specific about directive and regulations. I really want to know about uh, the reasoning between what is the difference? Uh, I mean, uh, the emergence of a regulation and directive and why, why is the difference? Because directive is usually uh, give a more freedom towards each national state to have more governmental power. And I just want to know what is the, the reasoning why the European uh, Union kind of created the regulations and directive. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, and that also indeed touches on the, the nature of the EU. So you have regulations and directives. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the instruments, a regulation is basically a European law. So the moment that a regulation is adopted, it applies in all member states immediately, just like a law. So it becomes the law in all states at the same time. A directive is a very different instrument a directive is adopted, and then member states get usually two years to implement a directive, which means that they have to translate the directive into their national laws. Um, to give you an example, there is an EU directive on, um, well, there's quite a few. We have 160,000 pages of, of EU law. Uh, but let's take the directive on services. So there's a directive to make it easier for companies to deliver services in the EU, the services directive. 
And that directive says, amongst other things, every member state needs to create a desk, a one-stop shop desk for people who want to provide services. So if I want to provide legal services in Germany, there should be one desk at the government where I go and say, hi, I want to provide legal services. What should I do? Now, a directive allows each member state to implement this in national law. So every member state must create a national law that implements the directive that actually creates the, the rules that the directive states. So directives do not apply directly in member states. They have to be translated into national law. Why is that? Well, it is because it gives more space and room to member states to uh, really connect these norms in their national system, to make them fit and connect them with other norms. Because the state in Germany works differently in France and in Portugal and in Estonia. Um, so if you would have a regulation, there is a risk that it would not fit well with the national legal system. So the directive gives more space. It respects the sovereignty of member states more. It respects their national legal systems more. And it gives them the opportunity to connect the EU law with their national legal systems so that they can all choose a different way how to implement this directive. Now, this also fits with the principle called subsidiarity, which means that if a member state can do something, you leave it up to the member state. The EU should only regulate those things that member states cannot do themselves. Um, so directives are actually the most used. The EU uses much more directives than, regu than regulations. Of course, the risk of a directive is that member states implement wrongly. What if a member state gets the directive wrong and doesn't do it correctly? Or in even more serious cases, if a member state decides purposely not to implement the directive because it doesn't like it. For example, there was a directive about protecting ancient forests. Um, Poland has a very large stretch of very ancient forest, but there were wood companies there. So Poland purposefully did not implement the directive against cutting wood in ancient forests. Um, and then the European Commission or private parties start legal action against the member state. So if a member state does not implement the directive, the commission or individuals can start cases in court to force the member state to implement the directive. So regulations are European laws. Directives have to be implemented usually within two years. Why do they choose directives? To give more legal space to member states to implement in a correct way, in a way that fits in their own national system. Um, I hope that answers your question or did you have a more specific issue? Uh -huh. or Is it already answered your questions, Anga? Can I push a bit further? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I just want to, to ask that the reason why the European Commission kind of created or the European Union created this kind of directive instrument in the first place. Why, yeah. why, why didn't they like, if, if they want to like uh, fulfill uh, integration, why don't just rely on the direct uh, regulations instead? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, no, thanks for, the, thanks for the question. So um, there's, there's two main reasons. Um, the first main reason is um, to balance national autonomy and, and legislation with EU integration. So the EU should be effective, but you do not want to limit national power more than necessary. And the idea was that a directive is less invasive. It is less costly in terms of national sovereignty and freedom, but you achieve the same aim. So um, a directive is actually a nice example of the EU being between international law and, and constitutional law, right? It is, gives more respect, more space to the member states. The second reason is that in some areas, a directive works better because it's actually better to have harmonized national law than to have an EU norm because a harmonized national law may be easier to apply and better to connect to the rest of the legal system. Um, let me give you an example. If you want to make something uh, criminal, say, for example, uh, ship source pollution, ships dumping highly chemical waste on the high seas. Now, if you want to make that criminal, 
then you do not have a separate EU criminal law. There is no um, criminal statute of the EU, right? Um, member states have criminal law. So if you want to impose a criminal sanction, you need national criminal law systems. Now, if you create a regulation, then that would be a self-standing regulation. If you create a directive, then that directive can force member states to include ship source pollution in their national criminal legal systems. And then it becomes more effective because it is part of national criminal procedural law, national criminal enforcement, national, you know, the national public prosecutors will start to prosecute it. You get a, a national punishment, you go to a national prison. So you can connect EU law directly at the national legal system. So it gives more space and sometimes it also makes it more effective because the EU, and this is really important to realize, the EU relies on the member states. The member states have almost all the money, all the civil servants, the member states have the police, the member states have the courts, the public prosecutors. Um, so the EU needs to use the infrastructure of the member states to work. Um, and the directive is also part of that. Okay, okay. thank you very much. My okay, pleasure. there are uh, another uh, participants who would like to ask. Now, uh, Al Abdul Rahman Al Fatih, who has already raised his hand. Now, okay, am I am I audible? Uh, wait a minute. After Abdul Rahman Al Fatih and uh, Daniel Nicholas, you can also uh, join with us to 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 ask your questions. Um, maybe first uh, Abdul Rahman. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. So, sir, you mentioned about the concept of sovereignty, that in the European Union, they have the supranational, supranational nature that makes countries or actually somehow, some way can be made in compliance with the EU laws. But what I'm trying to ask is, what do you think is the core difference between the concept of sovereignty in terms of the European Union perspective, as well as sovereignty in the international law perspective? Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. And now I have to uh, restrain myself. My entire PhD was about sovereignty. So uh, I can easily talk for oh, days okay. about this topic, <laughs> as, as Ali knows. So he may have to mute me at some point. But um, uh, I won't. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so what's the key difference? I think the key difference is the, the underlying idea of sovereignty. The public international concept of sovereignty is a relatively simple one. It means that a state has ultimate and final control over its territory and people. So the definition of sovereignty on the public international law is that you have your control over your people and your territory effectively and whether you need to be recognized or not is an open question. Now, I think the main difference in the EU is about the limitation of that sovereignty. Under the public international law perspective, you are always absolutely supreme. So you decide on, um, on whether you are limited or not, what you want to do or not. In the EU doctrine of sovereignty, you can actually limit your own sovereignty. By joining the EU, you accept certain limitations to the exercise of your sovereign powers. So, for example, um, under public international sovereignty, you are allowed to close your borders for goods. If you want to impose tariffs on goods coming from uh, China, you can do so. If you want to impose goods, so if you say that you're the Netherlands and you want to impose a 50% tariff on goods coming from, from a country, you can do so. And if you violate WTO law, then maybe you accept counter sanctions, but you can still do so. The WTO can never force you to remove your uh, tariffs. They can only impose sanctions. And if you pay those sanctions, if you accept tariffs from other countries, fine. Now, in the EU system, you have restricted your capacity. So if I want to, as the Netherlands, I want to impose um, tariffs on German cars, then someone goes to the Court of Justice and the Court of Justice sets aside my national laws. So I will not be able to do that. Um, 
Now, some people say that means that you're no longer sovereign. I think the better perspective is that you have agreed to limit the exercise of your sovereign powers. You have agreed that um, as long as you are part of the EU, there is an, an institution that can limit the exercise of your sovereign powers. But if you think it through, that limitation is still based on your own consent, right? It is based on the fact that you became a member of the EU and you accepted these limitations. Um, the major difference is that the nature of EU law is not determined by your interpretation, right? But it's, it's determined by the interpretation of the Court of Justice. So you have said, I limit my sovereignty, I accept all limits imposed on my sovereignty by the EU, and I also accept, and that is a major point, I also accept that other institutions can determine to what extent my sovereignty has been limited. And the only option you have of reclaiming that sovereignty is by leaving the EU. Right? You now have Article 50 in the treaty, the one that, that the UK used, and said, so I will leave the EU now. Now, the major question, I think, is, do you see this sacrifice, do you see this um, pooling your sovereignty or, or giving some of the exercise of your sovereignty to the EU? Does that mean that you are still sovereign or not? On the public international law doctrine, I think the conclusion is you're no longer sovereign because you no longer have all these sovereign attributes that public international law gives to a country. But I think under the constitutional doctrine of sovereignty, you are still sovereign uh, because states are limited by their own constitution in many ways. States have to protect fundamental rights. You have national rules about what the state can do and cannot do. So the mere fact that you limit yourself as a state, I think, does not interfere with sovereignty as such, as long as you have a more constitutional concept of sovereignty. If you start from the public international point of view, and this is the point that uh, Boris Johnson always uses, Johnson starts from the fact we're a sovereign country on the international law, so we can do what we want. And from that perspective, the EU violates British sovereignty. Now, that's, of course, a very simplistic view. I would argue that, of course, in reality, no country is as sovereign as Johnson claims, right? Um, as you know very well, all countries live in a global reality, and all countries have to negotiate and agree and deal with other countries. There is no country, not even the US, that is so powerful, it can just ignore the rest of the world. You can try for four years, but then I go back to Donald Trump again. Um, <laughs> so um, that will be my, my, my brief answer. Um, does this answer it, or did you have any specific elements in mind or specific examples when you asked your question? How was that, Abdul? Is uh, already perhaps, answer your question? perhaps a small pushback regarding the fact that you are no longer sovereign under public international law after you, for example, leave a regional organization like EU. But I think a quick question for this is, how do you see the fact that UK is living EU? Do you think British will be perceived as the same, knowing that it's the UK after it leaving EU under any kind of law? Actually? Thank you. Yeah, so my, my perspective there is that the UK will become formally more sovereign, but practically less sovereign. Um, let me give you an example. Um, formally, they regain the power to conclude their own trade agreements. So if you're a member of the EU, you cannot conclude your own trade agreements because external trade agreements are an exclusive competence of the EU. So the EU negotiates trade agreements as a bloc. That also means that the UK has not negotiated trade agreements since 1973. They always did so as part of the EU. Now, after Brexit, formally, the UK is sovereign. So the UK can go to the US, China, Japan, and say, let's conclude a trade agreement. And they have done that. So the first trade agreement with Japan and the UK has just been concluded. Formally, more sovereign. Practically, just imagine what happens. So the UK goes to China and says, let's talk about a trade agreement. And China says, okay, that's very interesting. What would you like? And then the UK will say, okay, let's look at the trade agreement we have with China or with the EU, EU and China. We want something better. And then China will laugh very hard and say, okay, when we negotiate with the EU, it's a market of 500 million consumers and the largest economic bloc in the world. 
You have 60 million consumers. You're in recession. You are hit hard by COVID and you're completely powerless after Brexit because you need a trade deal badly. You promised your people to have a trade deal. You don't have a deal with the EU yet. So you desperately need a trade deal with China. So what kind of deal do you think you'll get? Do you think she will say, oh, we're so proud of you now that you're sovereign. Here's a great trade deal. No, they will be completely taken advantage of. So factually speaking, the UK has lost power, even though formally speaking, they're sovereign. Um, so that's why I think you're lying to voters if you use this simplistic notion of sovereignty. If you keep pushing this historical romantic notion of an, a country that is sovereign and can do whatever they want, um, then you're lying to voters about the international reality. I think the responsibility of politicians is to gradually educate the electorate about the global reality and about what this means for national political power and decision making. Now, that is a very hard lesson, but it's a crucial one because the world will not become less dependent. Um, and I think if you really want to serve national sovereignty and national identity, then you think about how to create a modern concept of sovereignty that maximizes the influence of your country in a globalizing reality without going to simplistic notions such as ultimate power. So, so that would be my, my response to your question with the example of the UK. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Kyvers. I think continuing the questions about Brexit, there is a, one of our participants who also want to ask an issue about Brexit, Daniel, Daniel Nicolas. Are you here with us? Hello, Daniel. Hello, hello. Can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yes, uh, I, actually, I asked something about uh, Brexit, but uh, I'd rather use this time to ask directly about another issue that comes to my mind, if that's okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. that's okay. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, I had this question. Uh, I'm actually very fascinated about the interplay between the EU law and international investment law, uh, especially after the ruling and the ACMIA decision uh, by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, since you've explained earlier that uh, decisions of the European Court of Justice, the EU law has direct effect and primacy and can, could be applied and enforced in the domestic courts of member states, does this also apply to arbitral tribunals uh, constituted under intra-EU BITs? Since uh, I've seen a couple of times, uh, quite frequently lately, uh, the decision under ACMIA, uh, the CJEU's decision, has been ignored by multiple arbitral tribunals. They still give effect to the intra-EU BITs, ignoring the decision saying that the, those BITs are incompatible with uh, the EU law. Yeah. That is my first question. What what do you think? Uh, what do, do, uh, is are they bound by the decision of the ACMIA? And the second question is, uh, what do you think personally uh, whether the ACMIA decision is correct when stating that there is incompatibility between intra EU BITs and EU law? So I think those are the questions I'd like to ask. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. So we're we're jumping quite uh, from, a, from an introductory level to a more advanced level of EU law. <laughs> um, so thanks for those questions. Um, these have been hotly disputed because there's basically a major fight between the international financial arbitration world and the EU lawyers world on this. Um, in fact, one of my friends works for the commission and he pleaded the Achmea case for the commission. And then after they won Achmea, he went to a wedding uh, of someone who is in the international financial arbitration world, and he had a very horrible evening explaining Achmea to them. Um, so let me let me give you my brief um, answer. Um, Achmea is under EU law. Achmea is binding on um, arbitration tribunals in the EU. As long as you are holding your arbitration in the EU, and you're under the scope of EU law which you automatically are when you're in most financial situations, considering free movement of capital. Um, you are bound by Achmea, which means that you can challenge the validity of the BITs themselves because they violate the autonomy of EU law. Um, and the Court of Justice has held in previous case law that actually some parts of EU law are of um, public order nature and have to be applied by arbitral tribunals. So arbitral tribunals have to apply EU law, they have to respect Achmea, and um, that also means that if they don't, 
and your arbitration takes place in a member state, you run the risk that the arbitral award will be challenged in front of a national court. And then that national court will also be bound by EU law. So the national court will then be bound by Achmea to annul your arbitral award. However, many in the international uh, financial arbitration world think that Achmea was wrongly decided and therefore that they should simply ignore it. Now, if the arbiters do not apply Achmea, and if the case is not challenged in front of a national court, so if no one brings an action for annulment, for example, under the New York Convention um, against the award, then the award stands, right? Um, so if it's not challenged to a national court, the award stands. Of course, you do run the risk that if you try to execute the award, someone may again reject, try to reject it based on the um, Achmea problem. Now, at the same time, this problem will um, be gone relatively shortly because member states have concluded an agreement by which they have uh, decided to stop all intra-EU BITs. So member states have now agreed that all intra-EU BITs will be um, cancelled because of Achmea, which means that uh, in a couple of years, we simply have no BITs left. Of course, you may still have arbitration taking place under old BITs, um, but going forward, there will simply be no more internal BITs. And what we see is that the Achmea judgment has been nuanced a bit in the uh, Singapore uh, opinion of the court, um, because that there they slightly reduce their autonomy doctrine. Because personally, I believe Achmea was wrong. I believe the court went too far in Achmea and that it was too strong a defense of EU autonomy that they were too afraid of, of infringing the autonomy of EU law. Um, and I think that in the um, trade deal on Singapore opinion, that they actually nuanced Achmea a bit. So now there's more space for arbitration on uh, BITs, as long as it's BITs external, because internal BITs are gone anyway. Does that Thank you very uh, much for your answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's interesting. I, I, I would definitely check the Singapore opinion on that. I think your answer your really answers it. Thank you. Okay, that's quite comes to a quite detailed answer and context, but that's okay. It uh, gives us uh, information. There are still uh, the EU law may uh, touch in much more detail. Uh, content and uh, there are still two participants Atala Ailendra but I think uh, she is unable to ask him the questions directly uh, she posts the answers on the chat box uh, the, Mr. Dr. Kyvers EU has relatively relaxed trade and, trade and immigration policy that with this policy it guarantees all EU citizens and EU business community relatively easy and secure legally. But as you said, EU policy making is often the independent and could be passed without consent by the member states. And much of domestic populist oriented citizens within EU clearly resent such open immigration and trade policies. In your opinion, is this an EU overreach on member state domestic policy and law, or it's just certain communities unsatisfied with how EU and globalization works? Do you want to address? Uh, answers the questions, subscribers? Yeah, that's also a very big question going to the heart of EU legitimacy and how is it perceived by, by the people. And I think there's a couple of elements there. Um, first of all, um, you see that actually, if you talk about specific EU policies, then most people tend to agree. So if you hold questionnaires about EU policies, and you only ask them about specific policies, do you agree with the EU trade policy here or with the EU free movement policy here, then actually most people support it. Um, and even in the UK, there was a major uh, research done by UK civil servants about the levels of power of the EU, the areas where the EU has competence or not. And after more than two years of research, um, with, this was a year before the Brexit referendum, the UK civil servants themselves concluded that actually the balance of power of the EU and the member states is very logical. 
and that they wouldn't make many changes if they could. Now, at the same time, there is a growing feeling with many people that the EU is too powerful in general and that it affects their identity. So the resistance against the EU seems to be, be based more on a general fear and resentment of globalization than on specific policy areas. Because if you ask people, so what should the EU do differently? Then they don't often have very concrete examples. Or when something goes wrong, the same people that say they should have less EU want the EU to do more. So for example, in COVID, many people say the EU should do more. We need a harmonized European approach. But of course, if the EU should do more about COVID, then it needs more powers in healthcare. And so far, the member states did not want to give more powers on healthcare to the EU because it's a national competence. Now, I think what's really going on here is a different question. And I think that's a major lesson that I would take away from the EU. And that is to divide the benefits of regional integration better. If we look at the EU, then it's very easy to establish that the EU has increased wealth. I mean, the EU has led to economic growth and to more wealth. I think what has not happened well is that this wealth has not been divided well. So the added benefits of European integration, the added economic growth has gone disproportionately to a couple of groups in society, right? Higher educated people, people who already had some financial means, countries in the West that did very well. Um, so I think what you would need to make regional integration more legitimate is a mechanism to redistribute the benefits of regional integration better. For example, Germany is right now borrowing against negative interest rates, partially because um, of the, the monetary situation in the EU. Some of those benefits that Germany can borrow so cheaply could be used to help the Greeks and the Italians who are suffering and having to pay much higher interest rates. Now, the problem is, and this is really a very difficult challenge, that the power to redistribute, the power to give money from one member state to the other member state is extremely sensitive. This is known as a transfer union. And I fully understand that member states do not want to give the EU the power to tax and to redistribute money. But if the EU cannot redistribute money, then the EU cannot ensure that the benefits of integration are fairly divided. So, to address this problem of unequal division, you would need more EU powers, but the EU, giving the EU those powers would go further along the road to federation and would further undermine national sovereignty. And people don't want that because they don't agree with some of parts of the EU. Um, so this is really, I think, a dilemma. Um, the deeper you integrate, the stronger the need becomes for redistribution, for example, in Europe-wide uh, unemployment tax. But then those measures require very deep integration, giving the EU powers over crucial elements like social policy taxation. Um, and this is one of the main challenges, I think, for EU constitutional law to deal with. Also, by the way, on a short point, Actually, since Brexit, support for the EU has increased tremendously. So many people in the EU see the, the, the mess in the UK. And actually, you see that in all member states, there is now stronger support. And there's no more member state where um, even close to a majority supports leaving the EU. OK, uh, thank you very much. There are still more questions. Do you need a break or oh, one minute or two minutes? That's okay. <laughs> no, I'm fine. This is my hobby horse. So, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, there is also another question from Farhan. Uh, Farhan, would you like to deliver your question directly about the, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Ahmad Zarfan first, about the European Court of Human Rights. Ahmad Zarfan, are you here with us? Hello? Okay, uh, I would like to pass the questions to Farhan. Farhan? Yes. About the, uh, okay, Farhan, are you here with us? 
Yes, I am. Yeah, do you want to deliver your questions directly? Okay. Um, okay. Hello, Dr. Kivers. Uh, I would like to ask a question regarding how EU member states can attempt to successfully balance and synchronize international treaty obligations and also obligations under EU law on the assumption that it just so happens both legal instruments regulate on a similar topic. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, thank you indeed. So it, it, it can happen quite often that there is an overlap between international treaties and EU obligations. And there's two rules there. The, the basic rule is EU supremacy. So EU obligations trump international obligations. So if member states have an international obligation that conflicts with their EU obligation, they should follow their EU obligation. And they even have under Commission versus Greece, an old case, the obligation to try to change their international obligations in a way that will uh, conform with EU law. Now, there's one major exception, um, and this is prior international obligations. So if a member state had signed a treaty before it joined the EU, then the EU allows the member state to respect this treaty even if it goes against EU law, because the EU respects international law. Now, even in this context though, so if you have a prior obligation, so say you take um, uh, the Czech Republic and they joined in 2004, so they had a 2002 treaty with Indonesia, uh, an investment treaty with Indonesia. Then the Czech Republic can continue to respect this investment treaty, even though it goes against EU law, but the Court of Justice requires the Czech Republic to try and renegotiate this treaty in a way that fits with EU law. Mm. Right? Um, so that's the, the general relationship. Um, now, there is also very interesting case law about the relationship between EU law itself and international law. What if the treaties, the EU treaties, conflict with a form of international law? Now, um, you have, there are also questions of autonomy. For example, in the um, Commission versus Ireland case, Ireland had gone to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea uh, because it had a dispute with the UK about fisheries and, and, and waters. And there the Court of Justice said no. The UK is also a member state. The EU also has rules on fisheries. So you should have gone to the Court of Justice and not to the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, even though they also had jurisdiction. And then on the level of the EU itself, um, the most famous case here is the Cadi case law, where um, the UN had imposed sanctions on Mr. Cadi, who was supposed of terrorist sanctions. And these sanctions were imposed by the UN Security Council acting under Title VII, so the highest level of uh, protecting uh, peace. Um, so the highest level of UN authority being used. But these sanctions violated EU fundamental rights. Now, interestingly, here the Court of Justice said, we will uphold EU fundamental rights, even though, they via, even though this brings us into conflict with the Security Council acting under Title VII. Um, so there, they denied the supremacy of UN law over EU law, even though it's explicitly in the UN Charter, and the EU subscribes to the principles of the Charter, even though it's not a member of the UN itself. Um, so there's a couple of interesting dimensions there, but uh, does it answer your question or did you have a specific example in mind, for example? Um, I don't really have a specific example. I was just curious uh, as of to how, uh, because based on what I've learned beforehand regarding EU law, it's always been about supremacy. So thank you very much for the answer. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, Ahmad Zarfan, I think he has uh, connections uh, problem in his connections. I think his questions would be about the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, perhaps most non-EU uh, non-EU uh, uh, non citizens quite mis, uh, mis yeah, misunderstood about the about the, in the fact that the EU and the European uh, the Council of Europe is two different organizations. Uh, that's the, I think, the main thing, uh, main basis uh, underlying uh, under, uh, topic. But I think uh, the questions from Ahmad Zarfan about the European Court of Human Rights, 
Yes, the but I'm happy to take a question about that court as yeah. well. If that's a question. Yeah. Uh, do you want to directly answer the questions from the chat box, or should I? Um, from Ahmad Zarfan. So the European Court of Human Rights says the Court of Law of the Council of Europe. Uh, it's based in Strasbourg. And the court ensures that the member states of the Council of Europe respect the rights and guarantees set out in the European Convention. Question. My question is how the jurisdiction of this court has to enforce and ensure human rights in Europe. Um, okay, so indeed, um, first point is that this is a separate court. So it's a separate international organization that is focused on fundamental rights. And the primary treaty is the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, the jurisdiction of this court in Strasbourg is linked to all the members of this convention, the 47 members that are a party of the convention. So actually the Strasbourg court has more reach than the court of justice. The EU has 27 members, Strasbourg 47. So the Strasbourg court, for example, also has jurisdiction in Russia, in, in, in Turkey. Also in Turkey. Yeah. So any, um, now what's the jurisdiction? The court has jurisdiction over any violation of the convention. So if you look at the convention, it gives you your fundamental rights from uh, the right to life to the right to privacy, prohibition of torture and human treatment, but also a right to family life um, and increasingly additional rights and protocols, such as the right to property in Article 1, Protocol 1. Now, when does the court in Strasbourg have jurisdiction? That is, if you claim that your convention rights have been violated, by one of the three, one of the states that has assigned to the convention. So one of these 47 states has violated your right whilst you were in their effective legal control. So that means that either you were in the territory of a state or you were under their effective control somewhere else. For example, when the Netherlands was taking part in a UN mission abroad in the Middle East, People who had been captured by Dutch soldiers were under the effective control of the Dutch state. So the convention also applied to people in the Middle East under the effective control of the Dutch state. Now, you can then go to the court, but only, and this is a major difference with EU law, only after you have exhausted all national remedies. So if you want to go to Strasbourg, you first have to go to a national court of first instance, then you have to appeal then you have to appeal from the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court. And only if your rights have not been protected by the highest national court, can you go to Strasbourg and claim protection there for a violation of your rights. So it has jurisdiction over any violation of the charter, uh, of the, of the uh, convention, by one of the convention parties under their control. And then first you have to exhaust all national remedies, which means of course, that it's a very long route to Strasbourg. Before you come there, quite often you have to spend years in court. It can go faster, but often it's years. Does that answer your question? I think Ahmad Zahapan has probably connected and hopefully that answer from Dr. Kairos already answered uh, the question from Ahmad Zahapan. And we have Mr. Nofrizal. I think he wants to ask <laughs> questions. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Sir Armin Kavir. Yeah, and good morning there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have two uh, questions. Uh, the first one, you said uh, now uh, EU ha has more uh, directives uh, than regulations. So uh, my question is, uh, so uh, these two uh, secondary laws apply to exclusive competences? Uh, that that's uh, my first question. So, or whether it, uh, you, you already mentioned that uh, uh, there is there, there is consideration to to decide uh, uh, on which law the uh, EU uh, will choose, yeah, for for for, for particular uh, fields of, of law. But uh, uh, yeah, actually, my question uh, on 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 what criteria actually exactly in detail. Uh, they decide uh, whether they want to choose uh, to use uh, a, a directive rather than regulation, yeah? uh, or it, it just uh, uh, 
uh, applies to to all exclusive competence. That's the first question, and the, the second one: uh, uh, How do you uh, how do you view the situation now? Uh, what happened after uh, in after uh, the the statement of a uh, French uh, president? Uh, because I know that uh, EU should uh, respect uh, for the diversity, uh, while uh, Muslims now uh, uh, the, the community of Muslims in, in Europe uh, is uh, getting bigger uh, the, the number of people is getting bigger uh, so actually for me the the, the French president Macron uh, he should uh, pay respect uh, for the belief of the Muslim people even for uh, his own citizens yeah okay uh, those are two questions for me thank you thank you one legal and one uh rather sensitive political question um, um so on on the legal question the um first of all the directive or regulation is not linked to exclusive competence or not so those are two separate doctrines um whether the whether the union has an exclusive or a shared or a supporting competence is based on the type of competence um if you look at the um the the catalog of competences in the the articles three to six in the treaty then you see that there's different types of competences and um, they can use directives and regulations for all those competences although a regulation for supporting competence will not be very common um, so it's it's a separate issue now how do you decide sometimes it's easy in some cases the treaty explicitly says um, um, whether it's an exclusive or a shared uh, whether it's a, a directive or a regulation. So some legal bases only allow the EU to conclude a directive. Other legal bases leave it to the political parties, the political actors, so the council and the commission and the, um, the parliament to decide. Now, how do they decide? Basically, they ask, is a directive enough? Can we achieve the, the aim with a directive or even best with a directive? Or would the regulation be more suited? And the regulation is more suited, especially if you want to harmonize something directly. So let me give you an example. If you talk about EU food law, say that you want to create a minimum safety standard for food. Uh, for example, you want to reduce the amount of um, a certain chemical in fish. Right now for these food standards, you could use a regulation because from the moment the regulation comes into force, all the food standards in the EU will be identical. So you will have guaranteed consumer protection against this chemical in fish. Whereas if you use a directive, it takes longer and uh, member states may have different implementations. So the regulation is especially used if you want to immediately guarantee the exact same rule in the entire EU. Um, then coming to your second question, which is, I think, um, not just a, a, uh, a question for Macron, but for the entire EU, because basically what we see are, here are two conflicting um, views and perspectives on freedom of speech. Yeah. So from the Western European perspective, and especially from the French perspective, because you have to understand that the, the French see themselves as the birthplace of the Enlightenment, the place where the French Revolution took place, the place where the French Declaration on the Rights of Man was signed. Uh, so they see themselves as the torchbearers for the Enlightenment. And the perspective, the Western perspective there is that um, freedom of speech is the foundational value. It's the value on which mutual respect is based. So when we talk about freedom of speech, we actually think it's also um, a show of respect, of mutual respect, that you allow free speech because everyone gets to decide their own statement. Um, and a limitation of freedom of speech uh, to protect against certain speech forms that are insulting to others is therefore seen as being um, less respectful. Because um, imagine, for example, that another religion would then claim that something that is very important for Muslims is actually a limitation of their religion. So uh, say, for example, that um, one religion, Judaism, would claim 
that um, uh, certain Quran phrases are inherently um, insulting to their God. Would you then have to prohibit certain Quran phrases because another religion finds it's violating? So the, the underlying logic is that the ultimate form of respect is to give free speech to everyone so that you can respect everyone's views and perspectives and you can have an open debate about it. Now, at the same time, I think this conflicts, but then I, I go into slippery ice because um, I am not an expert in Islam. But this conflicts with a, a different perspective and idea of respect where there are simply um, hard limits to freedom of speech because the statements are so disrespectful that they fall outside the protection of the law. So some claims are simply so insulting and disrespectful that they fall outside what you should protect as free speech, um, which is a different societal and cultural norm. So it leads to a clash of two perspectives. Um, now, I think the best thing I can do is to understand the, is to explain the underlying fear. The fear in France and the fear of Macron is that if you, um, set some limits, if you accept some hardline limits about what you can say and not, then the fear is that we get an increasing fight over all these substantive limits and that different groups will want different limits about what you can say and what you cannot say. So I think one way to understand this is that this is not um, intended to insult Islam or the prophet or to disrespect the, the deeply held fundamental beliefs. So when people like Macron say, you should be able to accept this. It is in no way intended to say that there is no respect or, or um, agreement on that these are very fundamental values and that they strongly disagree with people who, who go across certain borders morally. They find it immoral, they find it disrespectful, but they do not find it illegal. And the fear is that if they go that way, then they will be forced to accept multiple limits on freedom of speech, which undermines their ultimate perspective on respect for each other. So I think we actually have to do with different conceptions of respect and the relationship between law and morality and freedom of speech, etc. cetera. Um, and that is the big divide. Um, and ideally, and this is of course talking as a scholar, um, I think it would be good to have more debate about how to bridge those divides and how to find concepts that can explain the different perspectives better. Because now um, it becomes a very uh, emotional and negative discussion between both sides. Whereas I, I really think that for the most, of course, there's always a couple of, of nasty individuals, but for most people, they just want to have a mutual respectful solution. That will be my attempt out of this political nightmare. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I think this is one last question. Uh, we uh, 10 more minutes to uh, four o'clock here. Um, from Wirawan Azhar. Wirawan Azhar, do you want to deliver your question by yourself? Hello, are you here with us? Okay, I think, uh, hello, Wirawan Azhar, are you here with us? Yes, um, yes. Do you want I, I to deliver your questions? Yeah, yeah, my question, uh, uh, there is a, in the chatting room, you can... Uh, oh, okay, okay, I will, I will read it for you. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, you. There's a case study about the uh, you, Germany and Denmark is developing the longest undersea railway in the world since 2008. What is the role of EU commissions on the project and how you low to benefit both countries, especially EU citizens regarding this project? Well, it's quite micro questions, but do you want to answer this question, Dr. Favors? Yeah, so um, um, uh, infrastructure is one of the um, areas where the EU has competences, but this is actually a collaboration between different member states. So the member states can decide to collaborate more closely if they want, but the only thing they have to do is that they have to respect EU law when doing so. So if three member states want to collaborate on an infrastructure project, then they can do so. Um, and it it's not supported or not steered by the commission. At the same time, it does fit within the European plan to create better connectivity through rail. 
because with the environmental challenges that we're facing, um, we need to have less airplanes and trains are a greener and, and cleaner way of, of, of traveling. So therefore the overarching plan of the EU is to invest more in fast trains. Ideally, you would have a very fast trains connecting the major parts of, of the EU. So of course this project fits within a larger infrastructure vision for the EU, but it's as far as I know, it's not driven by the EU or, or driven by the commission, but also by the interests of these countries themselves to be better connected. Okay. Is it already answered the question, the, your questions, Mr. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, for, because now we have a very uh, time limit. Uh, uh, I, uh, there, there are still two short questions, Dr. Kivers. Uh, yep. uh, it is direct uh, to participants uh, ask me to uh ask this question to you uh about the how how about the process uh, you 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 say on your presentations about the enlargement steps and uh how do you uh accept how eu accepts a state a countries to be a member state uh uh for example uh we know about the case about Tur turkey uh who is already applying for uh, EU member state, but uh, they are still not uh, accepted. And what are mostly about the considerations? Uh, and also uh, another oh, last questions, uh, it's more private law or to be, to be more specific about marriage law. Um, if there are two EU citizens from different countries, for example, uh, from Dutch and also another one from French and they are want to divorce and which uh, which law will be applied in the context of um, uh, the process of the divorce itself. Yeah. I think this yeah. is questions from Mr. Dr. Yoni. I, I hope the last question is not of a personal nature. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, so um, as to the first question, uh, the accession, there is a legal dimension and a political dimension. Okay. Legally okay. speaking, we have the so-called Copenhagen criteria, and the Copenhagen criteria set out the standards that you have to meet for joining the EU. Um, and if you want to join the EU, it's actually a very lengthy process. So first you make a political declaration that you want to join, um, and then there is a decision by the political uh, decision makers, the member states, whether they want to start the process of accession or not. Now, if you do that, then you start negotiations with the European Commission on a whole bunch of chapters. So there's more than 40 chapters on the economy, on your judicial organization, your civil administration, um, the different, different sectors of the economy, your competition law, etc. So then you start trying to see to what extent the country complies with the EU fundamental values, the EU rules, uh, on all areas where EU law is, is relevant. Um, and then, of course, they have to start preparing to implement the uh, all 160,000 pages of EU law when they join. Now, this is the legal process. So there's a legal benchmark. One of the legal criteria is that you are a European state. And of course, there is no clear definition of a European state but it would be a, a stretch probably if, if South Africa wanted to join. Um, so there are legal criteria. At the same time, joining the EU is also an intensely political process. And it's important to realize that uh, joining the EU requires unanimity. So every member state has a veto to block a new country from joining. And there are simple geopolitical and political interests at stake as well. Um, uh, you correctly mentioned Turkey. Turkey has been trying to accede to the EU since the, the 60s. However, by now, the relationship between Turkey and the EU has soured. I mean, um, Erdogan is not exactly a big fan of some, some European leaders and vice versa. So um, what you see is that in addition to the legal criteria, you also have political criteria. How would it influence power within the EU? Um, 
How will it influence the balance of power between the member states? What is the political perception? I mean, many uh, national citizens are now against um, Turkish accession. Um, so these political criteria play a role as well. And what you also see is that right now, the EU is a bit wary of further expansion. So a couple of member states are actually wanting to exceed, for example, Macedonia, um, and they are in the process of, of negotiating accession with the EU. But the EU is, as they, as they now call it, a bit uh, enhancement tired. They, they, um, they have absorbed many new member states. So some member states are now reluctant to accept new member states before things have settled down in the EU themselves. And this is simply politics. Um, so the reason that they accepted the 10 Eastern European states in 2004 was also to a large extent geopolitics. They wanted to stabilize the region, expand um, uh, protection um, also um, on request of those 10 states, protection against uh, Russia uh, by incorporating them in the EU bloc, um, knowing that economically these countries were not ready yet to, to join the EU. So it's, it's, it's law and there are very detailed books on EU accession and the precise criteria and how they are applied, the conditionality. So the commission will actually keep checking a country for years to see how they meet all these criteria and all these different chapters on a very technical legalized process and then next to the legalized process, you have your political negotiations. Um, well, and the, the second question, um, which was on, um, what was the second question again? I got lost in, the, in my answer on the first. Sorry? Ali, what was the second question again? Oh, I got lost. Question about the, uh, more about the marriage law. Oh, the marriage law, right. Yeah, yeah. If, if someone from, uh, if a, a couple's from different, member states uh, and then their divorce, uh, which law will be uh, prevail? Yeah, so um, this is actually a question of, of uh, private international law, yeah. as EU yeah. law does not govern um, the right to a marriage um, as such. Um, so it will depend on the, the, the private international law of the country where you're in. Whether, um, I mean, usually uh, the divorce will probably be governed by the, the law of the country where you where you married. The, okay. um, but it depends on the circumstances of, of the case. Also, the, the marriage contract itself, because maybe the marriage contract stipulated a different legal regime. Um, the only thing that EU, that EU law does is that it guarantees free movement of people who are married. So if you are legally married, yeah. then you have a right under EU law to be together and to move to different member states together. Now, what EU law also does is that it mitigates some of the effect of divorce. Say, for example, that um, I would uh, marry with uh, an American, right? Mm -hmm. And my American wife would join me here in the Netherlands then she would have a right to stay in the, in the Netherlands based on EU law. But if we divorce, then she would normally lose her right to stay here, except if we had been married for a certain time, then EU law grants her specific rights as well. So in addition to national marriage law, EU law gives additional rights in, uh, to, to people who are married, for example, in terms of residence rights, rights to equal treatment, right to support, health care, etc. Um, but the question of which law governs a divorce is one that is governed by private international law. Okay. Dr. Tivers, I think I missed one question that is already in chat box. And Anga still wants to uh, uh, ask questions. Hopefully you don't mind to answer this to maybe just a brief. Uh, maybe I will uh, read the questions uh, from the chat box and then Anga will uh, deliver the question directly. And I think uh, it, will, it will end up our uh, interesting discussions. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfectly okay. fine. <laughs> okay, the first one, uh, I think I missed the questions from uh, Himmel. Yeah, Himmel. Yeah. Uh, a brief a brief questions about the Brexit. Uh, maybe uh, could you explain more about what would happen if there's no trade, no trade deal? Is it about Brexit, Himmel? If there's no trade deal at the end of the transition period? I assume it is about Brexit. 
Could you please explain more about what would happen if there's no trade deal at the end of the transition period? And Angga, would you mind to deliver uh, uh, deliver your question um, directly? Okay. All right. Um, so I want to ask you, a question. Uh, sorry, Angga. Now? Can you uh, turn on your camera so we can see? I am uh, oh. turning on, but okay. the light is quite bad. Okay. Okay then. All right. Um, so I want to ask a question. Uh, this is in the perspective of uh, legal scholars. Um, uh, basically, I'm from the uh, Indonesian legal system with uh, civil law tradition. Uh, so if we're talking about EU law uh, in the perspective of Kelsen, a pure theory of law, the pyramids, uh, where is the EU law in your opinion in that legal theory? Uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, let's do brief questions. Um, so on the... Um... On the Brexit and the trade deal question. So it's actually one of the big questions now whether there will be a deal. I'm getting slightly more optimistic that there will be a deal. Um, it will be a meager deal. It will just be a basic trade agreement. But if there is no deal, um, then as, as scholars have rightly pointed out, it's not really the Australia model. It's more like the Afghanistan model. It basically means that the UK will leave the EU without any form of trade deal. So there will be no agreement whatsoever on access for UK goods, services, financial services, capital to the EU market. What would that mean? That would mean that as of January 1st, yeah, the um, UK would no longer have access to the market. So any goods entering from the UK would have to pay the EU external customs rate for example, UK cars would have to pay 10%. They would have to meet all requirements of EU customs law. So they would have to be cleared, um, accepted, checked. They would also have to be separately checked for conformity with EU product standards. All British financial institutions would, please, would lose access to the EU market immediately. Currently, UK financial institutions have a passport, an EU passport, so they can offer services in the EU. They would no longer be allowed to do so. So banks, insurance companies, investment companies, they would no longer be able to operate. Um, so basically, the UK would go from having complete access to the EU market, the way they've had since 1973, to having zero access, even less access than Australia or um, um, Zimbabwe even has more access to our market because they have international trade agreements. So it's really hard to overestimate the impact. Um, there's tons of practical things. Um, UK fishermen would no longer be allowed to fish in the waters. UK airplanes would, not, would no longer be allowed to land in the EU because there's no agreement on landing. Um, nuclear materials that are currently being exchanged, for example, for hospitals, for radiation therapy, are no longer allowed to move. UK medicines would no longer be approved in the EU. UK stock exchanges would no longer be accepted and equivalent in the EU. So clearance of, of euro-denominated debt may, long, may longer be possible in the UK. Um, so if you start, basically you can mention any economic sector you want and there will be immediate consequences. Um, so this is why I partially think that they will try to find some form of a deal because the impact is just too enormous. It's really... Uh, as if you, um, sorry for the nasty metaphor, but if you uh, separate Siamese twins by just ripping them apart, right? And then hoping that everything will end well. It, it will be very painful. Um, and I'm, I'm not just exaggerating as an EU lawyer here. This is really just legal and economic fact. Now, um, so that's that's on the, uh, on the Brexit issue. Um, then, uh, sorry, now I'm forgetting the second question again. Oh, Anga, Anga yeah. about the Kelsen? About the yeah, sorry, the yeah, the Kelsen theory. Yeah, so pure theory of law. Now, um, the interesting thing is that you get different answers depending on who you ask. Now, under the traditional doctrine of the Court of Justice, the Grundnorm, the pure theory of law approach, would be that EU law is its own Grundnorm. So the ultimate um, source of EU law is the treaties, and if you go one step further, I would even say that it's the general principles underlying the treaties, such as autonomy and effectiveness. Because ultimately, EU law de determines its own value. 
So if you change the constitution, EU law would not change. If the Dutch constitution would say EU law no longer has direct effect, it would not affect EU law. Um, now, of course, the interesting thing for Kelsen is that Kelsen ultimately decided that his ultimate good norm was public international law. And in his later work, and there, I think you see a difference that the EU would deny that public international law is the grund norm and it would de declare itself as the ultimate grund norm. Um, but the interesting thing is that almost all national constitutions disagree and national constitutional courts still consider their own constitutions to be the grund norm and the EU to be founded on the constitutional approval and support of the member states. Thank you very much for the answer. Okay, I think <laughs> if we want to discuss about the EU law, it for me it takes one <laughs> one whole academic year, <laughs> and I'm still not really uh, not as expertise, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Kaivers, uh, for uh, your uh, uh, for your willingness to share with us about the EU law. Um, I know it is it is. Uh, quite impossible for us to discuss about EU law in only a uh, couple of hours. Uh, before we end the session, uh, we are very honored that our dean is still here with us from a minute we from the minute we start the discussions until now. Uh, uh, Dr. Edmond Makarim, do you want to address something? Maybe a uh, statement. Uh, thank you very much. I am uh, obliged to say many thanks. That is the final, the final note for a word from us. So I cannot give a conclusion or given a highlight from these discussions. Yeah, we would like to learn more about this uh, after this discussion also. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Armin Kaivers. We are pre uh, appreciate for your time and your uh, help for us to discuss about these topics. Thank you. Thanks very much. It was my honor and pleasure, uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, discussion. You, uh, uh, um, there were very interesting and challenging questions, so uh, <laughs> um, it was it was a great pleasure. Yeah. Okay, then um, there is a special request, maybe from the Department of Constitutional Law of the Apollo University of Indonesia. Maybe in the next uh, opportunities, maybe we can arrange on a uh, separate. Uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, there, there is a request to discuss more about the sovereignty issue, Dr. Kaivers. Maybe, yeah, that just uh, uh, maybe we can arrange that later. But there's a special request from Department of Constitutional Law of the Florida University to discuss more about that issue, which you uh, had some uh, detailed research about that. Um, I think uh, that's all for today's lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. You close, please uh, <laughs> give the time for take some photos for us. Oh yeah, virtual photo yeah. session. Yeah, this is, <laughs> it is mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, before we close our session, uh, maybe we, we can uh, have virtual photo sessions. And hopefully, Dr. Kaivers, maybe if you have time or uh, maybe we will invite you when the pandemic ends and hopefully we will end this answer the same times immediately you can visit our beautiful country and we can also visit Netherlands of course and we are more than welcome to uh, to have you in our faculty uh, uh, thank you very much and be uh, my pleasure as well. indeed let us hope that this uh, this uh, really <laughs> weird COVID situation ends as soon as possible uh, yes. for, for many reasons yeah, Okay, uh, virtual hey. photo sessions. Uh, who, uh, the works. one who will take the picture is Anissa Hanareswari. Sorry? Sama Mbak Yuli, okay. Could you please all uh, turn on your camera so we have more, uh, we will have more uh, expressive virtual photo sessions. Uh, Hana, could you please make a countdown? Okay. Okay. 
Oke. Okay. Bisa? Oke. Okay. Okay. Yang keempat. Oh, uh, hey, Kelima? Belum. Oh, okay. Yang keenam. Oke. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kivers. Uh, Before uh, that, I will I want to inform to all of participants this lecture is uh, conducted with the collaboration with Dr. Joko Rusutono Research Center, Department of Constitutional Law, Universitas Indonesia, uh, ASEAN Legal Studies, and also Collegium Juris Institute. Thank you very much, and for all participants from students from the class of regional law and comparative law. Thank you very much. Hopefully, this will uh, enlighten our your research, and we will have um, uh, more. Uh, curiosity to uh, research more about any aspect of law, especially EU law. Dr. Dr. Kaibers, once again, thank you very much uh, for your very insightful discussion. Uh, without further ado, I will uh, end this question. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaibers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.